I mean, it's 15 years, right? So what did I learn over three companies, which was mm -hmm. you can't only solve the challenge through technology, mm -hmm. right? That you need to fulfill it. Hey guys, this is Sid Patel, your host from the Wine, Whiskey and Weed Show. After a long time bringing this show back with a special guest here, Philip James, founder and CEO of First Lead. You know, this is the company that uh, really is behind the scene, I would say. Uh, it's it's not got, you know, the, the brands that you normally see, but it is now, I believe, Philip, the uh, top 100 companies, almost 100 million plus revenue, right? Uh, which is, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, well, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, I mean, we were just named one of the top 50 wineries by size in Wine Business Monthly. I think it's this issue, right? So whatever that is, the February issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So about 350,000 cases uh, right now. Amazing. So back on that intro, you know, uh, he's founded many companies and I'm sure a lot of people know Lot 18 from the, from you know, when this whole thing like direct to consumer started. This was sort of the first uh, companies out there. Uh, before that, you know, uh, this whole blogging and wine platforms were forming. So Sooth.com, you know, you also you also sort of uh, had the wine audience, the consumers. You were you were always connected with the consumers. Like, and now that I see, you know, you always had that data of wine drinkers, you know, more than anyone else, uh, you know, if, if you talk about that. I love uh, how you are always a step ahead uh, from, you know, the, the where the attention of the wine consumer is. So let's go, you know, this episode is all about consumer behavior, you know, the AI, the big talk, you know, the technology you've been using smart sort of data, which is now termed as AI, I'm sure. So we'll touch base on that. For, for some of, you know, the international audiences that we have, uh, Philip here, you know, why don't you give us a little context about uh, your company and your journey, please? Yeah, happy to. And look, I really appreciate the intro. I, I think you actually summed it up really well, right? I've been around in uh, e-commerce wine for quite a long time now. Um, look, I grew up in the UK. I have a chemistry degree from the UK and a business degree from the US. But pretty much since 2005, have been involved in e-commerce of wine. And, and like you said, trying to help the consumer by using technology in the internet to help them make better choices. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I'm reading a book by uh, Chris Dixon. Uh, so he's a VC at Andreessen Horowitz now. And I think the book is called Read, Write, Own or something like that. But it talks mm -hmm. about this evolution of how the internet has changed over the last 15 years. And yeah, with Snooth, right? Back then it was more kind of, open databases and uh, kind of just the referring of the links uh, at Lot 18. That was the era of flash sale and Groupon mm -hmm. and Guilt and, and so on. And, you know, and, and DTC has also evolved over that time as well. And so here at First Leaf, we're vertically integrated. We're a, a winery and importer. We make and source wine from all over the world. Obviously, we oversee kind of everything from winemaking all the way through to the sale and the post-sale support. But that evolution has happened uh, across the web as well, right? Back in the day, you'd get a recommendation for a restaurant and you'd have to go find it yourself, right? And then there were services like uh, Seamless Web or Grubhub where they would send the order to the restaurant, but the restaurant would have to deliver it to you. And sure. now, you know, it's all kind of packaged together with DoorDash or Uber Eats where it's their platform, they run the delivery, they run the sale. And, and you know, people want people want it to be easy, right? And the web mm. 20 years ago wasn't easy. It was mm. kind of compartmentalized and, and a bit messy and you'd click on the link and you weren't sure where you'd go. And so to be good at DTC, we realized we have to do all of it, right? We have to source the wine, make the wine, sell it, you know, provide the guarantee, build the website, Mm. Uh, make the box pretty put the collateral in the box but you know that's first leaf and 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 certainly we've learned or i've learned uh you know over the companies i've started and over that era as the web has changed as well on that you know what, how was the model how did it got evolved like you first had the website and then you reverse engineered and built the company and bought the winery or first the winery and then up so I worked in the wine industry for a few years before I started my first company and and I, I had worked in technology before, technology banking. And, and so, you know, I felt I had some understanding of, of how the internet worked, but mm -hmm. I didn't really understand the wine industry. And really from that day onwards, I would find people 
back then would judge me negatively in the industry because I didn't, you know, I didn't know all the grapes or the good years or, or, you know, which region, you know, made which style of wine. Since then, I've never been able to kind of get my head around the fact that the wine industry sort of talks down often will talk down to its actual consumers. No, mm. no one else does that, right? If I sure. buy a book, watch a movie or buy an ice yeah. cream or buy pizza, people don't talk down to me. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't grasp that this giant industry was kind of mean to its consumers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and I've never seen a category where people kind of have so much self-doubt, right? So yeah. in all cases, I've tried to solve the same thing, which is, you know, a bit like you walk into a grocery store and they have a whole aisle of wine mm -hmm. and how do you choose, right? And maybe this one has an animal on it and this one has a mountain on it and this one has a, a building on it. But mm -hmm. most people... They don't know the brands or the regions, you know, and so on. So I've I've tried to work from the consumer backwards. Mm. Uh, and honestly, from Snooth to Lot 18 to First Leaf, there's been that evolution. But uh, but First Leaf started as a winery, right? So we did start making the wine and selling it DTC. And then over time, we added more and more technology around it, right? So we added the the personalization, the, mm. the on and, and all that you already learned and had from Lord 18 uh, era, right? Like you already uh, had a lot of consumer behavior insights mm. or the user X, you know, the beautiful landing pages and everything. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, it's just sort of two things are happening there, right? There's what I learned between three different companies. I mean, it's 15 years, right? So what did I learn over three companies, which was mm. you can't only solve the challenge through technology right? Mm -hmm. That you need to fulfill it as well. Again, think of DoorDash and Uber Eats today, right? Mm -hmm. You go onto their platform, they, they, they outsource the making of the food or they make it somewhere and they contract the driver to bring it to your house, right? And, and that's a kind of a one click kind of self-contained experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than how it used to be, right? When you used mm -hmm. to use the website and then a, the restaurant would make it. And then, I don't know, you have to go pick it up yourself. So people want the service to be mm -hmm. uh, integrated. And I learned that over time. And again, as the web built up, right? And as actually Winery DTC also built up, it's made that easier, right? Uh, there's more technology, there's more APIs, AWS, Amazon makes it easier, um, the vendors that we work with around shipping and compliance also mm -hmm. make it easier. Uh, and then within First Leaf, as we grew into a larger company, we we're able to invest more in the technology and the personalization at the same time. Great, great. Let's go on sort of, you know, uh, the talk of the town. I mean, overall, you know, people, we all know that wine sales are flat, you know, since last couple of years and it's expected to be flat in 2024, you know, overall. Uh, but uh, this whole non-alcohol category or spirits booming or RTDs coming in action, agave is in the mass culture of the world. This the overall, you know, more and more pressure is coming in wine. Uh, uh, what is your take on the consumer behavior uh, when it comes to wine? Uh, how are you seeing the consumer shift and how are you playing your strategy, you know, to still grow your wine sales? So there's so many there's so many macro forces going on, right? Um, and I try not to focus too much on the on the more recent ones. And so COVID, of course, right, was was huge over the last three to three to four years. Uh, a lot of people went through big growth. A lot of people then struggled on the other side with mm -hmm. uh, supply chain challenges, interest rates, too much inventory, you know, and so on. But as painful and as, as erratic as that was, it's these bigger trends I pay more attention to. So uh, uh, millennials or Gen Z maybe drinking less or coming into mm -hmm. wine later, you know, cannabis taking market share, maybe. Um, premiumization has been going on for, I mean, certainly as long as I've been in the wine industry. And, you know, and 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 like you said, overall, uh, wine consumption is pretty flat. Mm -hmm. Um the lower price points are shrinking. The higher price points are still growing. Uh, but I try not to pay too much attention to that because mm -hmm. we're still, you know, we're still like, I don't know, a fraction of 1% of the industry, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think DTC is growing um, and not like it did in 2020, but True. you've got to look at sort of the longer trajectory. When I started in wine, DTC was not even a billion dollars, 
right? Mm. And DTC is like 4 billion now, right? So I've seen this industry grow like 5X or so. And I agree, it's probably slowing down, but I think people are, and the pandemic showed it, if it's easy, if so the price I think, is good, You know, as Jeff Bezos said, like price and convenience will always continue. And especially the time. If you're saving them time by being convenient, uh, macro people are going to choose for that. You know, uh, but and, then- and, and sorry, and don't forget that it's something like, and I know a lot of companies are making people return to the office, right? But mm. the amount of people who work from home, at least some of the time, is still up 700% than it was pre-pandemic, which is, I think, a change that we'll see the impacts of probably for the next 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of, if, I mean, you know, you and I doing this over, over Zoom, but, you know, five years ago, we would have sat in a room together, right? Yeah. And I don't travel for business like I used to. Uh, and I think there's been a big reset that we haven't even fully felt the impact of. And if people work from home some of the time, more often, their ability to stay home and receive a package is so much easier than it was before. And so I think wine just has to keep trying to be, you know, easy, easier to understand, you know, interesting and relevant, rather than just looking at the macro trends, right? Because look, when I started in this industry, uh, you know, craft beer was hot, uh, spirits were shrinking, you know, and everything kind of reversed, right? Craft beer is not as interesting, spirits, cocktails are zooming, and, and these trends ebb and flow, and yeah. we're not really the market maker, right? We're just trying to present a great offering for people who are interested in uh, in a personalized wine club, right? And I think there's a lot of those people out there. We saw that during COVID. We just mm. have to keep finding them, you know, out on the web and out in the world. Hmm. So let's let's double click on that, you know, uh, so that we can add some value for our audience. Uh, you know, if you were to, def I'm sure you would have a consumer target, you know, like you, who are your top five, you know, uh, you, you can't sell to a 60 year old or 24 year old or 18 or whatever it is, right? But what's your top five consumer profile, if you had to define them? where you think is the best ROI right now for wineries to attack and market to? Sure. So we cater to people who who like wine. They like the discovery. They try to okay. try new wine is important to them. And, and because they want to try new stuff, I think it's hard for them in the store because they don't know what to pick. Right. And, and they don't feel confident enough to go have a 10 minute conversation with someone who works there. Um, those people typically are 30 to 60 years old slightly more women than men, but pretty close, good household income. I mean, hundred thousand dollars plus on average. Um, but you know, we have people who are in their late twenties, mid twenties, we have people who are in their seventies. And so it ranges wide. Uh, and, and we have a really strong geographical spread. And again, very different than a traditional winery where probably it's like California focus based on visitation for us. It isn't right. We still do very well in Facebook and direct mail and affiliates and uh, Google and, you know, like e-commerce, mm -hmm. right? So we do well through e-commerce acquisition. Um, uh, and I think much more about the psychographic than the demographic, right? So whether yeah. you're 25 or 65, to me, it doesn't matter as much. You need to like wine and you want to learn more about it, but yeah. you're not yet a collector, right? And we, we go for those people. Agreed. Understood. So uh, for those people, I think that that's pretty, you know, uh, interesting segment and that that is a nice niche. So what what kind of, you know, next study you do when it comes to, all right, this is our consumer, this is our play. And currently this 2024, these are the marketing strategies. This is where their attention is. Uh, now, for example, it can be more on Instagram and less on Facebook. So where are you sh uh, seeing attention shifts? For a while, Facebook was dead, right? I mean, mm -hmm. back in 20. 16, 17, 18, 19, Facebook was our dominant channel. But there was an era when Facebook, we went to zero, right? But Facebook is coming back. And mm. we now spend a reasonable amount on Facebook, not as much as we used to, but some, right? Yeah. And I think that's been Facebook's rebuilding ways to target when they couldn't use the sort of personalization that they used to, right? This is, think of Cambridge Analytica and the congressional mm. hearings and all these things, right? Cookies and all that stuff, right? And so the way that advertising used to target people is not as good now, not mm -hmm. as accurate now. Let me say that's a better word. Um, people opt out of that targeting, right? 
But mm -hmm. Google and Facebook created other ways to target, not based on the individual, mm -hmm. but based on like a category, right? And so we are based spending... on the user data that they collected. And now they're giving you sort of, all right, you want to target a, a person who works in engineering and this year, I mean, this age, for example. We, uh, for some of the platforms, you can't target like that anymore, right? So it used to be very, very specific, right? Mm. Based on cookie information. And a lot of people opt out. And so uh, Google and Facebook and so on had to create better ways of doing it. Not better ways. Compliant ways, right? Understood. Yeah. That work with people's ability to opt out for privacy reasons. And so they do it based on like cohorts and groups, not on individuals. But mm. it's good enough, right? And so we are starting to move some money back into those channels. I do nice. want to mention email. It's funny because the number of times in my career someone said email's dead. Oh, email is so good. I love email. Email works so well, right? We have um when you sign up and your your uh, order confirmation email we mm -hmm. have like a 75 percent open rate right it's crazy high and even like a marketing email which is you know you bought this how about you look at these other products but but you're talking let's compare apples with apples right what what about the new consumer that you're trying to approach not your your customer who've ordered obviously they're uh, going to okay. open it you know let, let, let's say business development you know you you want to now grow your sales in New Jersey. How are you going to get new people to see your emails? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the idea of renting an email list, I don't know. I think that's been dead for probably 20 years, right? That uh -huh. that doesn't, you can't, you can't just buy random emails. They, they don't work. There's no, there's uh -huh. no intent. But if you come to our site and you half check out and you give us your email address, but you don't finish um, those emails, like you left something in your cart, those can work very well, right? Because that okay. person still has some intent. They they True. might recognize your brand. They came to your website. They're not a customer yet, but they're halfway. And mm -hmm. so that's like a lead, like a qualified lead. Those can, those can work pretty well. Uh, and so email to your members can work fantastic. Okay. Um, emails to your leads, if they're real, right? Maybe they came to your winery and they signed up for your newsletter. They, again, the cart, they have created the account. Those can work fine as well. Um, and email sort of swings in roundabouts, right? So if if your competitors are sending email on a Tuesday, maybe you should send the email on a Sunday. I mean, whatever. These There are games people have over the years played with those things. Uh, we still do very well on on the, the standard uh, digital channels, right? Like I said, Facebook, Google, uh, affiliates, things like TikTok, we don't really do. Uh, the audience is too young uh some of these channels don't allow alcohol advertising mm -hmm. um we do direct mail i mean that's an old school channel right mm -hmm. like an on in the mail um it works well it's sort of the like often what's you know what's old is like new again and mm -hmm. you're sort of just trying to go where other people aren't right mm -hmm. so when everyone left facebook then it was fine to go back to fit you know when the advertisers left facebook it was fine to go back to facebook i think more important than like what's the channel mm -hmm. uh, is what do you do with the people when they get to the site because that's way harder right yeah and it's a context right to create that context and the conversion how are you going to convert that person with the context yeah and and i think a lot of sites kind of try to trick you right so like like you won't believe what the price is on this thing go look at the top 10 you know number seven will really surprise you a lot of people do these like clickbait type headlines but the problem is Eventually, you can't trick someone into mm. maybe you can trick them to clicking, maybe you could trick them into signing up. I don't know, but you can't trick someone to spending a thousand dollars with you over the next three years. I mean, that's like a real thing. And and so um we work very hard to try to convey what we are and why you would or wouldn't like to join, mm. and actually removing the people who are not good members and doing it quickly is actually really important, right? They, you know, you have to pay for the traffic, even even if they're not a good member, um, uh, if they don't like the wine or if mm -hmm. they're never home for delivery, then it's not productive for us. And so um, if you go through our sign up process, you'll see we're like, this is a club. This is what happens next, because we're trying to remove the people who wouldn't be good members, because for us, customer service, delivery fees, 
changing address. Yeah, that, that's a very that good point a because you always have to run an efficient operation. And I think that's something which other people should listen to that. I think that's an amazing point where, you know, the cost of the customer, uh, you always know, you know, of a cost of a bad customer and you want to remove that. Otherwise, you know, it's just going to come into a business model, right? There was an era, mm -hmm. particularly for companies that raise money, where it was growth at all costs. But that era was five years ago or more. Mm -hmm. And, and for a lot, I mean, we've been profitable for five, four or five years in a row now, right? We're debt free, we're profitable. And so I have to think of the bottom line, not just the top line. And exactly. so signing up bad members, people who don't like the service and leave immediately is terrible for the business, right? Yeah. Such a drain on customer service and, and, and our costs that I'd rather pay twice as much to get a good customer than two bad customers. Right. And so you know, we, we try really hard to make it, uh, to sort of disqualify people if we don't think they'd like the service, right? If you want $5 wine or $100 wine, or you don't want to join a subscription, we're not the service for you, right? If you're a collector or a total beginner, but mm. somewhere in the middle, you like wine, you drink it regularly, you're not comfortable talking about it in a store, you know, we could be the right service for you. And you are not tempted uh, to keep the user you know, just for the valuation game or something like you, you, you think that's still a bad idea. I mean, just for the sake of it, you want to say to someone, like, okay, I have hundred million users, you know, and then your valuation hmm. uh, game is different. Maybe that era comes back, but that's not an era today. Right. I mean, sure. VCs are not investing in e-commerce or loss making business. Maybe in AI, they do it right. But hmm. not in DTC vertically integrated e-commerce businesses. No, hmm. you need to have, revenue and profit, good margin, good retention. And you get valued off of those, uh, like the bigger metrics, you know, not the top line, but the yeah. the profitability, right? I mean, I think we would get valued off a multiple of profit. True, true. Back to the basics. Uh, yeah. Let's let's touch base on the AI, right? Uh, if you can share with us some good examples of how you are using AI and how other wineries can start using it based on the tools that are available, right? Yeah. So look, I love this question. Um, I mean, first of all, AI has existed for decades, right? But really when people say AI today, they mean the generative AI, right? So we use AI in our quiz and our recommendations, but we're not talking about that right now. So in terms of generative AI, in a more complicated way, we use it to power what we call wine print, which is sort of your each member has their like personalized profile and 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 you know you like these regions, these grapes, this kind of flavor in wine. But we use generative AI to write the section of text in natural sentences. That's more complicated. So let's just talk about some of the easy ways we use it behind the scenes. It is great at kind of summarizing and giving you uh, like quick feedback on data you have. So we might send out a consumer survey and we have thousands of responses. Chat GPT will help us understand what are the main reasons people like the club? What are the main reasons people unsubscribe? And it can do that faster and more accurately than we can, right? For us, someone would have to read 5,000 answers and then categorize them shipping. So just on that, so you upload uh, those survey results to, to something and then you run these questions and then it will just give you answers based on that data? Yeah, okay. exactly. I mean, there's a limit to how much you can put in at once, but mm. depending on which, whether it's chat GPT or something else. So we use that for customer service. Uh, you know, what were the main issues this week? And it will spit that back out, you know, in five seconds rather than five hours of human work. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it. So are there APIs to chat GPT? We use it both through API, right? So, you know, we, we have tens of thousands of members and I'd said their wine print. I mean, that's unique and that's done through an API. That's engineers do that. But I'm saying someone who's not technical in customer service can basically grab some data and just drop it in and say, give me the summary. What are the issues here, right? And okay. immediately chat GPT just on the screen, right? So I cut and paste, we'll give you a quick summary. Uh, <clears throat> we use... Uh, generative AI around images. So um, we might do a photo shoot and then two months later, we're like, oh, I wish we had some similar but different images, right? Mm -hmm. You can upload the images and ask it to create a new one based on that. 
all these things a human has to look at because you'll get six fingers and three legs, right? And so you have to, you know, you have to spend some time making the prompt accurate, but it's a lot faster than it is to do a second photo shoot. Um, so for example, on that uh, one, one question, uh, let's say you took a clean uh, image of front and back and then some other uh, wine bottle is there in a picnic spot with you know a few bunch of friends. And then you tell the software that you chain the wine to this wine. We use generative AI both at the engineering level, right? Which is through APIs on the back end of the website. But we also use it just through, like I said, cut and paste, copy and paste for text, uh, for images. Um, so our copywriters, look, if you're going to write about a number of Chardonnays mm -hmm. in a row, it's hard to come up with new language. Different text, yeah. Chardonnay. And True. so actually it's helpful because you can just drop the tech, you, you write your review, you drop it in and you say, can you rephrase this using different words? I can't keep saying mineral and taste like apples. Uh, and actually it will rewrite it and it's not perfect. So you have to look at it again, but it can help you like a thesaurus, right? It can help prompt, you know, a different way of writing about something. Maybe you wrote it too long and it can shorten it for you. And so I've really been pushing my team, but we use it maybe not in finance or legal, but otherwise we use it basically in every department, right? So winemaking, uh, brand design, copywriting, uh, marketing in the ads, in the images, uh, and almost all those people are not technical, right? And so it's just the interface on ChatGPT or uh, or DALI, or it's integrated into, um, it's like a paid, uh, whatever, like 20 extra dollars a month or something in, in Photoshop, um, but at the same time, we're also using it at that like uh, technical level with engineering. I have a, a question there, you know, a genuine question. Like, do you think Google uh, understands that this is AI generated text and then it's bad for SEO or it's still hmm. it's it's a myth? Uh, because I, I don't produce so much SEO content because I'm scared that what if, you know, Google also eventually will come out with its own and then ban all this content? I think... Generative AI can help write pages that you could use for SEO. Um, and I don't, I think it's, it's, I don't know if Google is trying to figure out if it's generative AI or not. I don't think that's the issue. If you're trying to write five pages or 50 pages, generative AI can help you create those pages faster. But again, you need a human to oversee it, right? Like you have to make sure it's not rubbish. But right, let's say and, let, let's say we're talking strategy here. Okay, we want to grow volume of, of website traffic, right? Now I I tell you that all right. How about uh, Philip? We write about every grape in the world. All right, let's start one paragraph on each grape and we make a landing yeah, page. Yeah, all so, you need to know about mm -hmm. Shiraz in twenty twenty four, and then we say all you need to know about Chardonnay in twenty twenty four. Yeah, yeah. So the the challenge isn't writing the copy. The challenge okay. is getting the domain authority or the link authority into those pages so they're all indexed. And I know this well because if I go way That's back in yeah. the, the snooth, this is a long time ago, and obviously Google's search engine rankings have changed a lot over the time. But if you're a website with low authority, you can't add a million pages, right? Because they won't index it all. And so... So, but if you're a winery with five pages, you could become a winery with 25 pages, right? If you have a thousand pages, maybe generative AI can help you get to five or 10,000 pages. Again, you need a human at the same time. So just keep thinking of generative AI in its current state to having lots of interns. If you mm -hmm. had a lot of interns, you might say, write me a page on every grape, right? But probably you should add you know the famous sort of french varieties and the well-known ones and then gradually add other ones people have to link to the pages too right you can't just have uh, an infinitely large website and nobody will nobody will link to it nobody's clicking on it and so so the seo strategy is a mixture of content generation and then building up the link authority right which you can do uh uh, you can do sort of naturally, right? If the content is good, people link to it, or you mm -hmm. can do a little bit more. So, so the link authority is still like that old days, right? Where how much how much external parties are uh, giving link back to you or clicking through external sources, right? So they've, they've changed. 
the, the algorithms they use obviously get more sophisticated over time. And, you know, they like unique text, they like freshness, that, you know, they like other stuff too. But in general, they still use a lot of the same types of signals that they always used to use. So mm. you need you need good enough content. I mean, it doesn't have to be like a novel. I mean, go look at a lot of news these days. It's not that mm. well written, right? Yeah, even, yeah, true. Even, even go yeah, to like, see, I know if you see just it's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Even when you go to like a, a well known, you know, CNN or Fox or wherever yeah, you go, yeah. a lot of it is not that well written, not like it used to be, right? It doesn't have to be Pulitzer Prize winning journalism. Um, but people have to link to your site too, right? And so you kind of you got to balance both. Mm. Um, but it's again, just think of having you know two interns or 200 interns hmm. and you have to use it a bit like how, how are you using it let's say as an owner as a ceo as a per, as a founder or as, as the guy at the top you know in your organization how are you hmm. you personally using it for business intel i mean so remember my team uses it a lot and for me that's really helpful because t i think of it as like having another five or ten employees right so it i mean we have roughly 80 people but with generative ai it's like having 85 or, or 90 people right mm -hmm. so it means we can do more stuff with the same amount of people i think that's, that's kind of good for everybody um it like i said is very useful in in analyzing a lot of data when we send out a consumer survey we might get ten thousand results mm -hmm. and i try to read them but i can't read ten thousand. i can't remember what was you know what happened seven thousand responses ago and it really helps summarize the data effectively um, it's really helpful for me or the winemakers to read the reviews we get of the wine. Um, you know, we get, I mean, I can't remember how many millions of ratings we have and we don't publish our consumer reviews on the site, but people can review the wine, right? And it all feeds into the algorithm, but it's helpful for the winemaker to understand, you know, why people like this wine or, or could it have been different? Could it have been sweeter? You know, should it have been made differently? And so it does help us summarize that text and make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we also interviewed, uh, you know, Dr. Marinda Kruger, uh, your wine maker, you know, and I think she's one of the yeah. first ones uh, trying AI in winemaking, you know. So let's let's also chat about how you use you using AI in the winemaking in, in sort of behind the scene business. Sure. So, um yeah, I mean, Marinda is, is a fantastic person to have on the team. And she, uh, 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 you know, we're a very data focused winery, right? I have a master's degree in computational chemistry. My master's thesis was in mass spectrometry. Uh, her PhD thesis was in infrared spectroscopy. We have multiple patents around using the data that comes out of these machines. And we have uh, a, a big infrared spectroscopy machine in our lab and then using it and the chemistry data that comes out of that to power the personalization. And wow. you know how amazing is it that we have a winemaker with a PhD in exactly this, this field. So we had to look far and wide to find her and she actually moved to Napa yeah. from, from South Africa. You know, of course she's a very talented winemaker, but for us, this intersection between understanding the data and the chemistry uh, and that feeding into the algorithm and the recommendations, like our recommendations for the consumer are unique to that individual, not, you're not in a cluster, right? It's not like, oh, people like Sid, you know, and 10,000 other people like big reds. It doesn't work like that, right? It's mm. based on the underlying chemistry um, of each wine and then your, recommend, uh, uh, your reviews that you've given us. And so it, we send out like 40 or 50,000 boxes every month mm. and like over 90 percent of each uh 90 percent of the boxes are unique combinations and so it's pretty crazy when you think that like you know it's not like spotify when we're both listening to like coffee shop music or whatever we're both listening to the same mm -hmm. station uh actually almost every member in the club is getting a unique track a unique set of wines in the box every How's single that? So 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 let's say if, if I ordered first lift Cabernet and with my preference, okay, I like more fruity, for example. And if someone else uh, say, you know, I like more, uh, you know, old style European style, let's say, you know, uh, you would do something and then you would ship it differently. Yeah. So um, every morning before the people in the warehouse come in and pack the boxes, the algorithm is running and based on your closest warehouse, your preferences, what's in stock 
what you've had, what you've liked, everything we understand about you, like we're picking the six or 12 or whatever wines unique for you. And so, you know, it's, it's more like Pandora radio or Netflix. I don't know what, what you see on your home screen is not what I see. Right. And Mm -hmm. when I, when I go look at like a friend's Netflix, um, sometimes if we have different tastes, I'm like, I've never even seen these shows. Yeah. But I'm trying to understand how is this related to the making of the wine? You're just going to make your, your SKUs, right? So the data is useful in fundamentally two different places. One Mm -hmm. is, We've already made the wine. And like you said, you just pick the skews and it goes in the box. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, Marinda and her winemaking team have to decide what wine to make for next year, right? And so looking at how the wines this year perform helps her steer that. So maybe she should the... Maybe she tried an extra fruity cab. You said you like fruity cab, right? So we try an extra fruity cab. And then the feedback on that helps us understand kind of was that too much or should it be even more fruity, right? As consumer taste change. So picking from what we've made is what we do every morning, but deciding what to make is what she's doing. So, so let's ask, what are the questions you are asking? Uh, so it helps other winemaker to collect some good intelligent data. You know, what, what are five or six good questions you can hmm. throw in here, which uh, other winemakers can ask on their websites to understand hmm. some data? Sure. So some of the, and we ask a lot of questions, right? But the ones that are most kind of significant and they drive the profile the most, how sweet do you want the wine, right? Because sweetness is like, almost has no end to the scale, right? So people will say they like dry wine, but how dry is that really? And then people who say they like sweet wine, I mean, you know, I like wine with a couple of grams of residual sugar, but people call that dry, right? And then then there are people out there that want wine with, and there are a lot of mainstream wines in the grocery store with, 20 or 30 grams of residual sugar and i think some people want 50 or even Mm -hmm. higher grams of residual sugar we don't make those wines but again it's helpful for us to tell the consumer before they have a bad experience and you know they can go somewhere else so Mm -hmm. sensitivity to sweetness is a Mm -hmm. almost infinite scale um something like tannin right I, i know tannin can give a wine structure but a lot of people don't like tannic wines right it's like dry and you know they don't like that half they don't really understand tannin unless they have strong tea where else do you have tannin in life right Mm. people don't experience that flavor we find that people would prefer uh to try new grapes from a familiar region more than a new region which i actually thought was interesting i thought people would try new regions first but actually they you know, they like one thing to be safe, right? They like the region to be safe and they're more willing to try new grapes. Um, we try and figure out the price point and how many bottles do they drink a month? And that's just helpful for the, which tier of the club or or what the frequency mm-hmm. should be. Um, but I'd say that sweetness, tannin, uh, and then their sort of adventurousness are the main questions we're trying to figure out. Super. Uh, on uh, other, like any, any tools that you can throw in as well? Like, we all know chat GPT, but other five or six tools that are good for, you know, the sales and marketing people to understand uh, their channels. Oh man. You know, I went and looked once. <clears throat> I think we have more than a hundred different SaaS pieces wow. of software. Um, and so chat GPT uh, and, and like I said, Dali and, and, and uh, paying for the AI upgrade inside Photoshop uh, you know, all of those things I think can work well. Um, uh, what about big... crazy egg and all that? Do you use user analytics, you know, where, where the button should be of add to cart and, you know, throw, uh, give us some tactical plays as well. There, yeah, so we use, word. we use some, we use so many of those. So, uh, there's one which kind of helps the consumer called aftership, which I think is very helpful. So aftership will basically help tell you where your package is and in theory fedex does but fedex or ups it's it's really hard to understand right because you don't understand if there's a problem with the truck or it's your fault right and aftership like turns that back into a human human speak so we use aftership and it helps um it helps kind of communicate to the consumer better like Mm -hmm. do you have to do something or is it still in transit somewhere uh and for wine that's so important right because you don't want the wine to get frozen or cooked or or lost in delivery 
um, we do look at yeah clickstream data and and you know where people are mousing on the screen. I think that stuff's pretty advanced and probably I would not advise the average winery to mess around with that. Uh, they can probably get a lot of what they want from Shopify these days. There are so many plugins, um, you know, and there's just so much easier than like trying to build the website, you know, the old fashioned way. Um, we use a service called Instapage, which is a very simple way that you can create like a test, like an A-B test, um, mm -hmm. or, or if you want to kind of make the like about us page or a content page, um, it can allow a non-technical person to make those kinds of pages. We don't use Shopify for first leaf, but if I was doing it again, we would probably be on Shopify. That's probably my biggest plug. And I've seen how easy it is to drag and drop and for a non-technical person to, to add in a, a SaaS service and, and move a module and remove a module. And, and, you know, for us, that's engineers, right? And we have to like code it and, and commit it, uh, commit mm. the code, but <clears throat> seeing how, advanced Shopify has become and mm -hmm. you know they have a wine focused vertical now um it's it's really impressive yep yep great I think they're coming to speak at our event as well uh let's oh, go okay, a little great. more more tactical as well if you don't mind you know I want to go on landing pages conversions right like if, if you saw a website I'm sure you immediately can say how you can optimize it and you know uh just for the basic small and medium-sized wineries out there uh, what are some elements they should really, really pay attention to and get it right? I think a winery should look at, well, the winery should have Google Analytics. Let's probably start with that, right? So I didn't say that before, I forgot. Um, we use it. We also use others, but Google Analytics is free. And so at least a winery should be able to tell themselves what percentage of their traffic is mobile. And, and I, so many winery websites are built for desktop and mobile is just like an afterthought. And sure. you know, we are 75% mobile traffic and 75% of our conversions are mobile. And at this point, internally, we will only, I will only look at a mobile, uh, like a mock-up for a mobile page. I don't even look at desktop. And <clears throat> it's a it's a tough transition, right? I'm sitting here with a 27 inch monitor, you know, with a fast internet connection and all the designers have beautiful, you know, Mac monitors and, and whatever. And then you forget that people are probably like, maybe they're not mobile, they're not running around outside, but they might be sitting on the couch, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And they might be in the office and whether it's an iPad or a cell phone, the reality is um, if it's anything like us, uh, the predominant traffic is mobile and, mm. you know, that's how people read emails and so on. And so does that, I mean, really for, the past 10 years, people should have been designing mobile first. But at this mm -hmm. point, we're like mobile only. And you have so much less space, right? And so you have to really make a choice what goes above the fold, right? What's on the screen. And, you know, if you want to put the content, the wines, the button, like something has to give, right? And I see a lot of mobile pages. By the time you take a desktop page and you make it mobile, like they're like seven screens long. And, and the content the button might be three or four scrolls down and you have to really make a different set. Of, you can't just make it smaller, right? And you can't just like put it vertically and you have to kind of hide it in a carousel or have a drawer that can open and to really design for mobile first or mobile only, basically, uh, you have to make a totally different set of choices. And don't forget the people building your website are sat there at a desk. I mean, that's their job, right? And so I'm always trying to remind my team that people are using the site in a different way than we're sitting there designing it. Yep, 100%. Uh, what about like other elements uh, like testimonials or reviews or, you know, bottle images? You know, where are the five or six things that you've hmm. seen? Just it's so basic 101, which people are not doing. Hmm. I think having some some kind of third party trust or validation is important, right? So it can be reviews of the wine, but it could be like your rating, Better Business Bureau or, or Trustpilot or some third party thing. Um, and then that you can't just put it on the site. Now you have to look after it, right? So if you go put the Better Business Bureau logo on your page, you also have to assign someone every week, mm. you know, customer service or whoever, they have to go go to that page. And if there's a negative comment, they have to answer it and deal with it. And so- you should put those things on your page, but you should also assign someone to go manage 
your reputation on those third party services. Same with awards, right? I mean, you can't just have awards from five years ago. You have to keep mm. uh, submitting and you have to keep those fresh, right? Um, I think that and consumer, uh, the consumer testimonials, you know, people care, like, is this trusted, right? So is it trusted by the press or or the the authorities, right? The the Better Business Bureau and people like that. And then what do people like me think, right? And so that second stage is the consumer testimonials. The second one is a bit easier because those don't have to link anywhere. But that first set, making sure that it links back to the press article or or it links back to that, you know, industry body. I think all of that stuff's really important. I mean, again, simple things that work well on mobile. Uh, I don't know. Can people zoom on the image? And I don't mean like, mm -hmm. you know, does it have a magnifying glass like that? But yeah, like, like that. Image, as long as it's clear, you know, once you do that. Yeah, like, can you pinch to zoom? Can you zoom in and read the label? Uh, people are often trying to read, you know, what's the full name or on the back label if you up, which you should upload, right? What's the alcohol content or, you know, what's the what's the region or people try and read the back label. And again, often the images or the way the website's designed, when you put it on mobile, it sort of doesn't let you do that, right? You're zooming yeah. in and it's pixelated. And so really trying to think through that experience, you know, as the consumer is researching. And I think, look, put the button on the page, make sure you can always see the button, try and have- What, what are some good colors? Uh, let's say, what hmm. are some good colors of the button, you know? Uh, I'm mm -hmm. assuming that white landing pages are the best because it's neat and tidy. And then what what is a good color button for the conversions? I mean, you've seen it, you've done it, you know, uh, and what are yeah, the I mean, text? I think the biggest thing is making sure it looks good on mobile, making sure you can pinch to zoom the image. Uh, I think the reverse text is bad, right? The white text on a black background, it's harder to read. And certainly the tiny fonts that people, you know, the designers sometimes use is not Fancy, helpful. Fancy, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, look, Google is a white web page with blue links, right? And like, probably that works well. It doesn't look fancy, but it does work. I mean, we have bright, bright buttons and bright colors. And so I think a bright colored button. What do you use? Add to cart as a text? I mean, add to cart or next or check out. I, I, if you're trying to change the button color or you're trying to change the word, you're down to like 5% changes. And I think wineries can still get 50% changes by no music, please, no flash, uh, you know, get to the content. Don't give me like an animated video in the way. Think of the like the actual winery, uh, the websites a lot of wineries still have, you know, they're like kind of what was cool in 2005, uh, like a flash animation and mm. True. It doesn't have to look exactly like Amazon, but it functionally should be a bit more like Amazon. People know yeah. where the buttons are. People know where the image is. People know where the review copy is. And look, you can still have nice colors and put it in your brand, mm. but don't don't reinvent how like web design functions. If you mm. go to if you go to Japan and you use the web in Japan or China, it's really hard as a Westerner to figure out because they have like different orientation on the page. So oh, yeah. don't reinvent the wheel. Like use your colors, but try and keep the layout basic and, you know, and follow a template like a Shopify template or, or, or whatever that people, you know, that people know how to use. And again, the button should be here and the, the image should be there. And there's some basics. And if you're reinventing it, it's going to be hard work. Mm. Nice. Uh, any uh, closing remarks or any words of sort of advice, you know, anything that you would want to share with the industry uh, on 2024 navigation? I encourage people not to focus too specifically on what's happening exactly this year, because this year I still tell everybody we're still part of the pandemic. I know we're not wearing masks and we're not locked down, but we're still going through the tail end of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. And I encourage people to think more of the longer term trends. So, you know, what were you thinking in 2018 and 2019? Those are the real trends right those things are still happening even if the pandemic you know craziness has been the dominant uh, story for the last three years right and so um eventually interest rates will go back to normal and i think dtc growth will continue maybe it's a bit slower because of you know millennials and cannabis and other things but the erraticness of the supply chain and the pandemic those are temporary and even if it's five years those are temporary and I think most of my time around the 10 and 20 year trends 
because those are the ones that are that are really happening in the background. Would love to know your thinking process, Philip. You know, just as a more of an entrepreneur question here or a CEO question, you know, how do you uh, spend time for thinking about business? Uh, meaning, you know, to reevaluate that you are staying on track, what's new, you know, any new opportunities, uh, what do you have to cut, what do you have to double down? You know, I think I'm pretty fortunate today that I have a very good executive team who basically can run the business for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and at the beginning, it wasn't, right? I have a co-founder and him and I did everything. And then we had three and five and 10 people. And I was still running around like a headless chicken <clears throat> doing tiny tasks, 100 tasks a day. Um, but over the last couple of years, company, you know, three, four years, the company's big enough that I have a C-level team. I have a I have a company president and they know how to run the business for me, right? So what's the marketing? How many new customers? What's retention? Shipping out the boxes. They do all that stuff, right? And so I spend a lot of my time reading, right? Reading the internal reports, looking at the data, reading the consumer data, uh, and a lot of my time thinking about what's next, right? And what's mm -hmm. next for us is six months, 18 months away, you know, two and three years away, uh, I still get pulled into day-to-day -day things a few times a week, but not every day. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking about what's the mountain behind the mountain we're trying to climb. Uh, and then periodically we'll take my team offsite. We wrote remote. So we go actually on site into the office mm -hmm. and we sit together for a week and we really talk about, Hey, if we achieve the goal for this year, like what are we building so that next year will be even better. Right. And making sure that we're really putting time into technology and AI and and the wine and the sourcing and all the things that day to day you can not ignore, but they're not urgent, right? They're long term and they're important. And I have the luxury of avoiding a lot of the short term and urgent because someone else on the team will, will deal with that for me. That's hard in a small company. If you only have 10 or 20 people, you probably are stuck in the day to day. So maybe like, can you carve out two hours a day and put it on your calendar for next week and forever? Like, where do you do your deep thinking? I think it's so easy to get caught on the treadmill of the day to day. And you really have to make sure that when you get to tomorrow and next year, that you've put some thought into that already. Any favorite books that you would recommend for the leaders or CEO that, that sort of is good for, you know, or anything that you have come across in the last 12 months for you. So I'm just going to pull it up right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I just download, I listen to books on audiobook usually. Mm -hmm. So, and I mentioned it near the start of this, right? It's called Read, Write, Own, O-W-N, right? So Read, Write, Own. And it's by Chris Dixon. Uh, he is a technologist and now a venture capitalist. And this book, we started off this conversation with the sort of evolution from Snooth the Lottie team to First Leaf. And his book talks about how the web has changed and how it went from like open standards to like walled gardens and mm -hmm. Facebook and, you know, Twitter controlling all of it. Uh, and how he sees AI and blockchain kind of opening it back up. And for a company that really wants to follow what's going on in tech, uh, I really recommend that book.